this is a review session for AS chapter 14 and 15. We are going to look at waves and superposition. As usual, if you are joining me live in the chat, just ask questions. Lah. All right. So here you will see that uh, when it comes to wave, we are going to classify waves into two types. So you can see that this is a periodic back and forth motion. It looks a bit slow, but sure. So the first thing you will notice is this red color thing represents the particle. So the particle here is moving up and down, but the uh, wave profile or the blue color shape is moving from left to right. So this is transverse wave. For a longitudinal wave, the particle is moving left and right, and the wave pattern also looks like it's moving from left to right. Okay, so this shows us uh, what are the types of wave that we will classify them as. Okay, so just give me a sec. I'm going to go back. And where is my... Okay, there we go. So the first thing you need to know is the classification of waves. I'm going to do 14 and 15 together at the same time when relevant. Okay, number one, let's look at chapter 14. We need to know how to describe wave. If we don't know how to describe a phenomena with the correct words, we cannot study them properly because we may not be saying the same thing. So when we describe waves, right, we can describe in terms of uh, motion or direction of oscillation of particle. versus the direction of propagation of wave. So we are comparing these two things. Direction of oscillation and direction of wave propagation. So this propagation is propagation of wave energy. If you don't want to think about energy, then that will be wave profile. Okay, so we have two types. For transverse, the direction of oscillation of particle is perpendicular to the direction of propagation of wave pro of your wave profile or your wave energy. So the so-called 90 degree one will look like this. This one is moving up and down. Okay, a bit slow. Don't know why today. Why are you so slow today? I said to my brain. Okay, so this one is going to oscillate up and down and the profile is moving left to right. So what you need to know is just definition and some explanation. Okay, and for longitudinal, you are going to travel parallel. So the direction of oscillation of particle is parallel to the direction of propagation of your wave, part, wave energy or your wave profile. These two tells you or talks about the direction of oscillation or the direction of motion. Okay, so this is classification number one. Classification one. We talk about motion. Example of transverse waves are like uh, electromagnetic radiation or your light, string wave that travels on a string, your water wave, okay? An example of longitudinal wave is sound, right? The second classification uh, that about wave is progressive versus stationary, okay? So we have progressive wave. And just now, the video or the uh, little simulation that I've shown you both waves are progressive. You can see uh, it's like the particle is traveling from left. I mean, the particle is oscillating. This red line is oscillating from left to right. But the wave pattern, uh, the compression and refraction, looks like it's transferring from left to right as well. Whereas this one also looks like it's traveling from left to right. So the profile actually moves. Right. So I think for your benefit, I guess I will crop this some stuff. All right, but if you need any visuals while you study, the good old internet is available, the videos are available, okay? And if you go to the notes, I probably, or oh, there's already probably a link to link you to this simulation so you can stare at this long time, okay? So these are progressive wave where your wave profile is actually moving. 
So I'll just label here. The wave profile looks like it's traveling in this direction. The wave profile looks like it's traveling in this direction. So if the wave profile is going to travel, I can say that energy is propagating. This is progressive wave. My energy will travel from one point to another point. Okay. Um, if let's say you want to find lambda, I will take the compressed area to the compressed area. Here to here is wavelength lambda. Okay. Or the center of the rare fraction to the center of the rare fraction. Here to here is another lambda. Right. If you want to find lambda for transverse wave, it's even easier. You look for a cycle. So here to here is lambda. Okay. Or you could take minimum to minimum anywhere. Lah. Doesn't matter. As long as it's 360 degree, this is lambda. Many lambdas to be had. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to look at is the amplitude. So if we observe this thing, and if I decrease the amplitude, I make it very small, and then I play this, you will notice that the height has decreased. And even this uh, red color line doesn't go as far away from the dotted equilibrium line. And if I increase the amplitude, it will go further away from the dotted equilibrium line. Okay. So this point actually tells us that the more the amplitude is, the more energetic the wave is because, you know, oscillation, half m squared, a squared, omega squared. And also the more, the higher the frequency, the more energetic the particle is. Because it needs to go many cycles in one second. Okay. So have that in mind, that wave is all about energy transfer. So for progressive or progressive wave, the wave profile will travel, the energy is propagating. Okay. And the second thing, the second classification is standing wave or stationary wave. So for stationary wave, right, the wave profile is stationary. So wave profile is not moving. There is a list of comparison between a stationary wave and a standing wave. So it's stationary wave and progressive wave. You can find them in your notes. But my notes are loading a bit slow. Is it an internet problem? Okay. So if you go to your notes, when the picture load, this is the uh, comparison between standing wave, okay, there we go, it's loading slowly, between progressive and standing wave, right? So the first thing we're going to look at is that this progressive wave, the energy will travel from one point to another point. Standing wave, the energy does not travel, okay? And when we say the energy does not travel, it will be trapped between two nodes, all right? So I'm going to pull up Again, a simulation for you to stare at it because the only way to learn this thing is to stare. Okay, so this one is a standing wave. If I play, I'm, I'm just going to increase the period so we don't get a headache, okay? So this one, the profile is not moving. It's like it's stuck in place on then it just vibrate up and down, up and down, up and down. Okay? So this is an example of a standing wave. What you need to know about standing wave is the wave profile appears to stay in place. The energy is trapped between the nodes. Okay. The second thing is the amplitude is constant for all the wave particle. This amplitude will change from zero. Here is zero. You go here is maximum. You come back down here is zero. You go here is maximum. You come back down here is zero. So if we were to look at this, uh, okay, I'm going to just max out this one you will see that this particle have maximum amplitude, all right? But if I change the position of the particle, let's say I pause this, and I put this particle at somewhere here, and this green particle never goes as high as the blue particle. You see that? Or maybe I put them side by side. Okay, let's put the green one here. Okay? So the green one will never go as high as the blue particle. So every particle will have different amplitude. 
And there are certain particles that I put here. We call this node because this particle is not moving. See this particle B? So sad. It's just stuck there. No move. He's stuck. And then you watch particle A just oscillating and working so hard. Okay. So anti node is maximum amplitude. This is particle A. Node is when there's no amplitude. Node, no amplitude. Okay. So it will go from zero at node and maximum at anti nodes. Back to zero. Okay. And the second thing is the particles will reach maximum displacement at the same time. So if we were to go back to this, and I'm going to once again move particle B to here. So somewhere here is the maximum displacement of particle A and particle B. But they reach the maximum displacement at the same time. That's why their phase difference is zero. So let's say we go to the bottom one. They reach maximum displacement at the same time. So here, here is maximum displacement. Okay, that's why they move together one. They go up together, they come down together. They go up together, they come down together. So if you want to think about phase relationship, then the all particles between two nodes are in phase. The phase angle is zero. Okay, all particles that are next to the adjacent node is out of phase, 180 degree. So what I mean by that is if let's say I were to whoa, put this particle B here, they are always anti-phase 180 degree because they are traveling in opposite direction. When it comes to standing wave, there are only two possible answers for phase difference. It's either zero because they are between the same nodes. No, it's like, hey, you my friend, you beside me. You and I are between the same nodes. We will always move together. You and I are opposite nodes. We will always move opposite to each other, 180. Here, these two will now be zero. Because you are the opposite to my opposite means you and me the same law. Okay. So if you go here, it will be opposite again. So you can see this is 180, 0, same direction. 180, opposite direction, 0, same direction. Okay. They are always either 180 or 0. But for progressive wave, right, the adjacent particles are out of phase one. Just say it's out of phase. Okay, and this is the more important one. You should be able to tell the wavelength. I think this is straightforward enough. And then for your standing wave, right, the wavelength is two times the distance between two adjacent anti nodes. So if I'm going to look at a standing wave like this, okay, a wavelength would be again one complete cycle, but the distance between two nodes. Okay, so I guess there. But do bear in mind that what we're looking at for standing waves the wave profile is not moving and then this is the alternate position now uh, here this is the alternate position so normally we draw like this to show the alternate position okay. so we need to know for these two classification uh, we're going to, so for this one, the important point is note. This is note. Cannot see. Note. Note. Anti note. Anti note. So the distance between note and note is lambda over 2. All right. So at level 1, normally when they ask you to define, for standing wave and progressive wave, you need to know a bit more. The first thing you also need to know besides, uh, identifying them is what are the conditions for standing wave okay and the next thing that they could ask you is how to set up standing wave so the condition for standing wave is two waves are identical but travel in opposite direction and for this to happen your standing wave, right, normally we must have a reflector. So if let's say you have a loudspeaker here, so this is the source of the wave. On the other side, we will have a reflector. 
So the incident wave overlap, incident wave overlap with the reflected wave. So when they both overlap, you form standing wave. Go and look at your notes. Okay. So the idea here is the wave from the loudspeaker will be reflected at the reflector, the wall, the mirror, whatever this one is. Lah. Incident wave and reflected wave will overlap, forming standing wave. Standing or stationary wave. Third point that you need to know besides the condition and how to make stationary wave is the comparison. Like I mentioned just now, you need to know the conditions, you need to know how to make the setup, and then you need to know the comparison. Comparison between progressive and standing, like I showed you just now. Okay, so it also goes without saying that when describing wave, if we can classify them, we need to be able to describe the things that we classified, right? So here are some important definitions which is generally listed, but I think maybe as an exercise, I will do it with you. Lah. You need to be able to, when it comes to a wave, talk about its important parameters such as amplitude. Most of the time, the symbol is A, sometimes it's X naught. Talk about frequency, F. Talk about the period, T. Intensity, I, phase angle, phi. Okay, so whenever we look at some a wave, right? If let's say I want to talk about amplitude, this is straightforward enough. Maybe I have a sinusoidal wave like this, and amplitude is here A. So if I think about this diagram, and I know this one is A, Almost immediately, I can think of the definition already, which is the maximum displacement of wave particle from equilibrium position. Okay, so the way I recall definition is by diagram. Lah. You may have a different method. So maximum displacement of wave particle from equilibrium position. We must measure from somewhere and we will always measure from equilibrium position. Okay, frequency. Number of complete oscillation in one second. Okay, this unit is hertz, uh, bracket, H sec. Okay, period will be time taken for one complete oscillation. Intensity. Intensity I is related to energy. So I is proportional, or let's say the equation first, I is equal to power, wave power per unit area. So from this area, right, we can say that I is proportional to 1 over area, which means I is proportional to 1 over R square, because the wave was spread out in 2 the second one would be intensity is proportional to amplitude square. This is area. Okay. Why is there a square? If you remember your chapter 13 oscillation, if you started studying your A2 somewhere there, you know energy of particle. Total energy of particle is half m a square omega square. You see the a, you see this a square is proportional to energy. Energy is proportional to power. That's why you have amplitude square here. Okay? If you don't know, then you don't know. No? Never mind. No? Memorize for now. It will be enough for your AS. The second thing is amplitude is proportional to frequency square as well. Because why? Power is related to energy, energy is related to omega. And I know if you did any A2, you will know omega is 2 pi f. 
So that's why there's a frequency square here. Frequency and amplitude square. All right. So this is the origin and this is the ratio that they tend to ask you a lot. Or they could ask you to determine any of these values. Of course, since our wave is traveling, you can always use the wave equation V is equal to F lambda or V is equal to lambda over T. Okay, combining these two. Oh, I've forgotten our friend, the wavelength. Fine, I'll add wavelength here. Where is my wavelength? Okay, so wavelength symbol is lambda. We define wavelength as the distance in two wave, two consecutive wave particles that are in phase. Okay, they move together. So now we have this uh, cute little term called in phase. So meaning we need to talk about phase angle. So when it comes to phase angle, right, there are two ways to look at phase angle. And I'm going to spend a bit of time here because oftentimes this is the source of confusion for many people. OK, so when it comes to phase difference, it's us using Trigo to try to describe the difference between either two different waves or two different particles. So let's start off with two different waves first. OK, so let's say now you have a. Uh, These two waves, the red one and the blue one. And I move position the wave two until it is directly on top of wave one, overlapping. This phase difference is zero, meaning there's no difference between wave one and wave two. Let's say I move wave two a little bit. You can see the phase difference begin to increase. Let's say I move, or I don't know whether it's possible, but let's say I move until it looks directly opposite something like this. So if it's directly opposite like this, 180, wave 1 and wave 2 are entirely opposite. Okay? And then if I continue to move wave 2, ah, can wall until it overlap. <laughs> it's not going to let me overlap. Can I overlap this? The face angle here was 0. You look at the numbers, huh? we go from zero, increase, 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 increase to 180. Okay, and then decrease, decrease, decrease all the way again to zero. So normally phase difference, if you think about quadrants, right? For physics, we can stick from zero to 180, or we can take all, all four quadrants at the same time. So this one needs a bit of trigger. We'll do some question later. But the whole idea is this phase difference allow us to compare the angle between these two sine waves. So when comparing the angle, right, we use ratio, all right? So right now you can see, oh, let me adjust the wavelength a bit. Is it possible? Okay. I'm going to adjust the wavelength such that the wavelength is about, I don't know, about 2.1. Okay. So 2.1, one cycle is 360. Use ratio. Okay. So when I say use ratio, I mean, 360 or 2 pi is equivalent to 1 lambda, which is also equivalent to 1 period. Okay, then from this ratio, if let's say you have two waves like this, one wave is here and another wave is here, what we can do is we can find this distance x. So we want to know x is how many degree. We can read x from the axis, what? then we can use ratio to find the degree. Or if x is time, we can use ratio to find the time. So just use ratio. The second thing that we can compare is the phase difference between two particles. Okay, let's say you have particle A and particle B. These two particles will move in opposite direction. So this is what we call antiphase. Not out of phase, but antiphase. They are always opposing each other like opposite all the time, see? Okay, so if I were to put this one and increase it to 360 or zero, which are the same thing essentially, if I can, okay, close enough. 
360, then you will notice that they move together. This is what we call in phase. And the distance between the red particle and the blue particle is lambda. That's why the definition of lambda is the distance between two wave particles that are in phase. And it has to be adjacent because I can actually say that this particle here and this particle here are also in phase. But their distance is not lambda, it's two lambda. Two lambda because they are not consecutive. There's another particle here that will be in phase with both. Right? And just so that you can see what is uh, out of phase, slightly different at any angle. This is out of phase. There are certain times they move together, like here. And then there will be other times where they move in opposite direction, like now. Opposite direction, then same direction. And then down here, one will be going up, one will be going down. And then after that, same direction. So this is out of phase. Out of phase doesn't mean anti-phase. Okay? Out of phase is anything that is not in phase. So let me try to write down some terms first. So if I say in phase... My phase angle is zero, I guess, or 360. She's still zero. If I say anti phase, my phase angle is 180. You can write this in terms of pi. I'm sticking to degree, la, okay? If I say out of phase, this means this one is any value but zero. So you could say anti phase is also out of phase, la, but sure. So this is how we can describe waves and uh, normally they don't ask this alone. They will ask this in tandem with some stationary wave question or some formation of wave question. All right. So I'm going to do some past years now. Let me pull up some past year. In the meantime, if you are still around, if you have any questions, don't be shy. Just let me know. Okay, as usual, I'm going to focus on the 20 papers because they are more recent and hopefully you have already tried them okay and there are many questions that are already recorded for you a uh, wave right seldom asks on its own uh, without uh, combining with chapter 15. So 14 and 15 are very closely tied. Okay, it's almost impossible for them to ask only wave. So if you look at the past year collection topicals that I've given to you, normally wave will come with either stationary wave, standing wave, or some form of uh, other scenario. But for ON20 paper 2 1, question 5. The wave question is pretty straightforward. Okay. Uh, straightforward is good. So here you have this general wave setup. Okay. And then you are asked to determine the. Okay, I should probably. Crop smaller, give me a sec. The ratio of the intensity of wave X to wave Y. Okay. So if you check out this question, uh, normally when they give you information about the wave, it is in some graphical format, like this one. So we have the progressive wave Y passing a point P, and this is how the wave changes, the displacement of the wave changes. I know that this is MM, may need to convert later. All right, so this 4 is amplitude, 8 cm is wavelength, okay? I know the period, period is one complete cycle, T will be 0 0.4 second. Determine the speed of the wave in meter per second. So I will use V is equal to F lambda, but maybe I don't have, maybe I don't have a, uh, Frequency, so I can use lambda over T. Oh, I guess you can find frequency, okay? Frequency is 1 over T, yeah. So I have lambda 8. I'm going to change this to meter divided by the period, which is 0 0.4. Right? So HCM divided by 0 0.4. 
okay, would, that would be 0 0.2, 0 meter per second. For the 4,672 times, 2 to 3 SF, do not write 0 0.2. Very pain if you lose mark that way. Second wave Z has a wavelength. Okay, okay, the second lambda, lambda 2. This is amplitude 2. Wave Y and Z have the same speed. Interesting. For the wave at point P, calculate the ratio of intensity of Y to Z. So immediately I recall intensity is proportional to 1 over distance square. But point P is at the same point. So from here, you know R is constant. Okay, law next. Intensity is proportional to amplitude square. So your A1, your first amplitude is what again? 4.0 mm. So A1 is 4.0 mm and A2 is 2.0 mm. Okay, I'm probably going to use this later. Next, intensity is proportional to frequency square. Miss, is the frequency the same? Uh, no, uh, the wavelength is different. So what we can do is we can use V is equal to F lambda. Okay, so this V is constant. And because V is constant, I can say F is inversely proportional to lambda. You could find the new frequency. I don't mind, but I don't need to. Okay, so the new frequency divided by the old frequency, F1 over F2, or maybe I should put F Z over F Y will be lambda Y over lambda Z. Lambda Y is the first wavelength. First wavelength was 8 cm, 8.0 cm. Is it? Is it the same wavelength? Oh, they have the same wavelength. Ah, yeah, talk so much. Wavelength same. Sad. So this is one. Lah. But in case it's not the same this year, then you know. So I'm going to start a question with i is proportional to a square f square. So Isaac over i y will be equal to a z over a y square times f z over f y square. And because the wavelength is the same and the speed is the same, this thing is actually one. This is one. So now what we have left is i z over i y will be equal to the amplitude of wave z, which is a two. This is z. This is y. This will be 2 over 4 square. So your answer is 1 over 4 because half power 2. Ma. You don't write your answer as 1 over 4. Ah. Must write 0 0.25. Must. No excuses. Must. Why must? Ah? Because all answers for physics paper must be written 2 to 3 SF. You write more SF, doesn't, it's not that bad. But if you write 1 over 4, I don't know 1 over 4 is how many SF, okay? Please ask maths teacher. 1 over 4 is how many SF? So for the final answer, no fraction. And make sure it's 2 to 3 SF. Alright. So that's it for this question. This is 3 marks. I think if you write intensity is proportional to a square f square, you get c1 mark. And then if you ratio correctly, let me change the color of the pen. This one is c1. You ratio correctly, you put 2 and 4, you get another c1. The final answer is a1. Uh, very nice one. Okay, and then for this one, you use V equal to F lambda or lambda over T is C1. Your final answer is A1. Make sure it's 2 to 3 SF. Huh? Okay. So this is a pretty straightforward question. And it's only 5 marks because question 6 is another wave question. From the same uh, paper variant. Alright. So for question 6, this is a question for stationary or standing wave. This is a very basic level 1 question. Describe the conditions required for two waves to be able to form stationary wave. So these two waves must overlap. Overlaps. Okay. They are identical. If you feel identical is a bit sketch, you can just say that they have the same frequency 
wavelength, speed, and amplitude. Okay. But traveling in opposite direction. This is the conditions. We need to produce two waves that are everything the same, except they are moving in opposite direction. And the easiest way to do that is just to allow it to reflect. Lah. Okay? So the mark here, when they say two wave overlap, must have the word overlap or meet, and then traveling in opposite direction or moving in opposite direction. So this one is B1. The second mark is when you say that they have the same frequency, wavelength, speed, amplitude. If no amplitude, you cannot get notes, okay? Cannot cancel out. This is B1. Another mark here. Okay. The stationary wave on a string has node and anti nodes. The distance between a node and the adjacent anti node is 6 cm. State what is meant by a node. So, rightly so, we saw from the uh, Stimul simulation, <laughs> forgotten the word, that the nodes do not move, so zero amplitude. Okay, just so you know, if they ask for anti node or anti node, this is maximum amplitude. Okay, calculate the wavelength of the two wave forming the stationary wave. So if I'm drawing a stationary wave, let's say I draw a longer wave, lah, it will look something like this. So this is my stationary wave. And it says here the distance between a node and an adjacent anti node. The word adjacent here means next door. Chan Zizhen was adjacent to Qin Wei just now. Adjacent, no? Next door. Okay. So when you are next door to each other, this is a node. This is the adjacent anti node. I know there are more anti nodes here and here and here, but these are not adjacent nodes. So these are not adjacent. This one adjacent. Next door. So at any rate, this is 90 degree, which is equivalent to lambda over 4. So lambda over 4 is 6 cm. Lambda will be 24 cm. Okay, state the phase difference between the particles of at two adjacent anti nodes. Okay, two adjacent anti nodes means uh, this anti node and this anti node. Okay, it can also be uh, yeah, this anti node and this anti node. Make sense? But whatever it is, they are always opposite. So the phase difference is 180 degree. Wow, so easy. Okay, let's pray this one come up. Okay, let's look at slightly different uh, standing wave question because not everything is easy. And some chapters will be easy, some chapters will be hard. Depends on your luck whether you get the easy or the hard one. And no, I cannot tell the future, so I don't know. Okay. So I'm going to do uh, another one. I'll just randomly pick. If you see anything that you think I should discuss, you can let me know in the chat. Question 5. This is May, June 19, paper 23, question 5. We're going to level up our standing wave uh, game, so to speak by looking at air columns. Okay, so we look at standing wave theoretically. Now we want to see it in different, different equipments. So, oh, explain how a stationary wave is formed. Okay, as I pace, I want you to think about what we will write here for the two mark. How a stationary wave is formed. We did something similar, but it is not the same. Uh, 
All right. So in this question, you see that there's a vertical tube. And it's 0 0.60 meter open at both ends. They very helpfully label the anti nodes and the nodes. So this means I can draw. This is one wave. Oh, so beauty. This is the other position. Okay. So when it comes to air column, just so you know, uh, your revision, air column got two types. Open end. This is the open end. Open end means uh, the whole air column is open like this. And the only thing you need to know is the open end must be anti node. So this is one format. I'll draw another format for you. Maybe in between there's another anti node. So then the wave would look like this. Node is here. Anti node is here. The node is here. Anti node is here. Okay. So the wave will look like this. This is another possibility to fit inside this tube. There are infinite possibilities. Okay. So we keep squeezing one lambda over two inside. So whenever you level up or you add another lambda over two. So if let's say I am I want to draw the next version of this, I add another lambda over two inside. So it will look something like this. So if you count the loops, this length is lambda over two because this is 180 degree. This length, let's say this length, this whole length, this will be lambda because it's 360. This one will be one lambda and a half. So this will be three over two lambda. So every time you level up, you plus lambda over two. Half lambda plus la half lambda is lambda. Lambda plus another half lambda is three lambda over two. So recognize that this is an arithmetic progression. If maths is your language, this is an arithmetic progression. Okay, so this is your open end. Close end, close end is a little bit more special. Okay, one end is close, duh. <laughs> the other end is open. I like physics. Uh. The way they name things is very duh one, which is good, right? Imagine a physics, uh, a physics person naming their kid. They're just going to call it son number one. Daughter number two, or child one and child two. Okay, so we're going to close the tube, okay? So at the close end, you must be node. Why are yeah, miss close end, no space to move, so must be node. Open end, law of space to move can be anti node. So the simplest form is actually to have the wave like this. I'm going to draw it a bit big so you can see the shape. So in this case, this is lambda over four. And then the other one would be we fit a loop inside. It's going to look like this. Okay, so this will be 3 lambda over 4. Once again, when we transition, what do we add? We always add a loop inside or we add lambda over 2. So if let's say for practice purposes, I'm going to draw the next one. Why is drawing important? Because Miss Lee has a potato memory but an excellent processor. So I prefer to analyze rather than memorize. Because if I like to memorize things, why I want to study such a difficult subject like physics? I just go memorize a bunch of facts ah, and warm it out during exam. Get A now. Lo. You, I find memorizing very hard. Lo, okay. So this is note. Anti note, nah, note, anti note, note, anti note. This one is one cycle. Nah, here to here is lambda. And this is quarter lambda. So that means all oh, this is five quarter lambda. One plus one quarter is five quarter. And once again, you will notice that A, we transition and we add another lambda. Is it a conspiracy? Is it Illuminati? No, la, no, la. it's just pattern geometric progression. Whenever we move to the next subsequent one, the wavelength will get shorter and shorter and shorter to fit inside this. And only at this length, you hear the nice resonant music when you play your flute or your instruments. Okay, so this is air column, your standing wave. So let's go back to the question. The incident sinusoidal wave of a single frequency travels up the tube 
and the stationary wave is formed and the anti-nodes and nodes are labelled. Explain how stationary wave is formed in the tube. So when we say how, I'm not asking for conditions. I'm asking how do you fulfil the condition? How to fulfil condition? Which is identical wave opposite direction. There must be some reflection somewhere. Okay, so I will say that the incident sound wave reflects at the top end of the tube. So if the incident sound wave reflects, so your sound wave is going to travel from the bottom here and da -da 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 -da. reach here, reflect, miss. The tube is open and you cheat my feelings. It's not going to reflect. It's not going to reflect, right? It's going to reflect. How do you know it's going to reflect? Because there's a pressure difference inside and outside the tube. There's a pressure difference inside and outside the tube. Inside the tube, it's still a bit harder to move. So the reflection happens because the, there's a pressure difference. between this layer of air and the layer of air inside. Is it, as, is it the same as a closed end? No, because it is still open end, the air particles are free to move, but they will get reflected at the open end. So it will be reflected at the top end of the tube. This is one mark. Then we talk about overlapping. Okay, so incident wave, this incident wave overlaps with reflected wave. And then you want to finish it just to be safe. You can say since uh, both waves have the same amplitude, speed, and frequency. If speed and frequency, the same wavelength is the same, no need to say already, okay? Where frequency, standing wave is formed. Okay, reflection already imply travel in opposite direction. But if you're scared that you don't hit this keyword or you just want to be sure, then you add another sentence or then uh, the incident wave overlap with the reflected wave traveling in opposite direction. Since both waves are the same amplitude, speed, frequency, standing waves are from, is from, standing wave is from. Okay, so I think your A1 is incident wave, overlap, reflected wave, and both wave are the same. Amplitude, speed, frequency. Okay, so that's part A. Two marks. You can see they like to ask this. Next, sketch a graph to show how the amplitude of the stationary wave vary with height h above the bottom of the tube. So to make our life easier, so I don't have to scroll up, scroll down. I'm going to crop the tube, drawing of the tube, and put it beside here. So we are going to measure H above the bottom of the tube. So meaning to say dot 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 here H is zero. Dot 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 here H is zero point six zero. So we have anti node here and here, meaning the amplitude will be maximum. Means what is the exact amplitude? No number, don't know. Any number you like, lah. okay, lah, I put here. Lah. Any number, doesn't matter. So there's an amplitude here, and there's an amplitude here. Okay, and then there's a node in the middle. In the middle will be 0 0.30. So 0 0.30, the amplitude will be 0. Okay, so this looks like a cosine wave. Lah. Okay, so you just join them. It's not a quadratic. Uh. Remember, of course, these are all sinusoidal one. Let's draw something like this. Now. Can now. So the two marks here is actually pretty easy to get. The first one is uh, maximum value at 0 meter, h equal to 0, and h is equal to 0 0.60 meter. And the maximum amplitude must be the same. 
And I think the mark scheme says line connecting these two maximum value, the max values, and 0 0.300, 0, this point. You can draw a straight line, you can draw a V-shaped graph. They didn't specify the shape, meaning you can draw anything as long as you connect the dots. I mean, I know it's a cosine graph. Lah. If you want to know more, go to Wikipedia. The derivation is there. The variation of amplitude against position. Okay, next. For stationary wave, state the direction of oscillation of air particle at the height 0 0.15 meter above the bottom of the tube. Okay, I'm going to go back to the tube now. 0 0.15 meter is in the middle here. 0 0.15. So this thing is the particle. Let's say you imagine there's a layer of air particle here. I'm just going to highlight. So this is your layer of air particle. They will be traveling parallel to the direction of propagation because this is sound wave. So this particle will move parallel to this direction of wave. So I will say up and down. No? Or you could say along the sides of the tube. Okay. Next, what else can they ask? Phase difference. A phase difference between the oscillations of a particle 0 0.10 and 0 0.20. I, yeah, I paste another one here. Lah. Okay, so where is 0 0.10? It doesn't matter. Let me draw the wave profile. 0 0.10 is somewhere here because this is 0 0.3, right? So 0 0.1 is somewhere here. No? This one is 0 0.10. 0 0.20, eh? 0 0.20 is somewhere here. No? They are still within the same node. Every particle along this side will travel in phase. If you have trouble visualizing this, once again, let me pop up. You imagine this particle... So you take the shape of the wave and I can, oh, I can adjust. Let's see if I can adjust until I get the, oh, there, there. Ah, we are, we are, we are. Okay, like this. Correct. This was the wave inside your pipe. So here to the node is 0 0.3. So 0 0.1 is somewhere here and 0 0.2, I guess, is somewhere here. La. Ish. Play. Can you see they travel together? This is blue particle is 0 0.1, green particle is 0 0.2 because this node here is 0 0.3. I roughly only, la, but it doesn't matter where particle B is or A is. As long as they are between here and here, they are in phase. Here and here, it's in phase. Okay, so because they are in phase, they travel together, the phase difference is 0. Your answer can only be 0 or 180, just a reminder. Speed of the sound is this one. So we can use V equal to F lambda to find the frequency. We know this is 340. We are looking for frequency. What is wavelength, uh, miss? You look at this shape, oh, you can see lambda over 2 is 0 0.60. So lambda is 1.20. Sub 1.20 inside, you can find your frequency as 340 divided by 1.2. Okay, so that would be 283 hertz. Or 280 hertz. Hertz. Okay. Do I need 2SF for 0? Says the chat. No need lah. 0 no need. I also don't know whether you want to count this 0 as 1SF or not. My pure maths is not good. Okay. Right. So the frequency of the sound is gradually increased. Determine the frequency where you get the next stationary wave. So in order to get the next stationary wave, this is the first wave, right? Okay, I'm going to draw here. You get this one. So it's either you know we add another lambda over 2 or you draw. Lo. So the next variation inside your tube will look something like this. Uh, we add another loop inside. So from here to here, you plus lambda over 2. So right now, your... First, lambda over 2 will be equal to the length, which is 0 0.60. This is lambda 1. 
So lambda 1 is 1 1.20. For lambda 2, so this is lambda 1, this is lambda 2. For lambda 2, lambda 2 is straight away 0 0.60. So you can see when you move to lambda 2, right, your wavelength divide by 2. So your frequency should times 2. It should be 560. But if you cannot, then you will again know V is F lambda. No problem. 350 F over 0 0.60. Frequency will be 560. Okay, it's one mark only. So uh, just to be safe, in case the mark is at some obscure pace, I will make sure I will at least write this line. Okay, in case this line got marked. And then uh, for this one, two marks, you use B equal to F lambda correctly, you get C1. By identifying the lambda correctly. So this is stationary wave. Normally it's like that one. They could ask you to sketch something, but most of the time they will ask you to, if you know how to draw this, you have a very powerful tool already. Okay, so stationary wave, that's it, law. This part. So there are certain objective questions where they will test whether you know the uh, different types of, we call this over, overtone, la, overtone or harmonics, okay, or different types of possible frequencies. Another type of standing wave, okay, so standing wave, uh, let me summarize for you. So if you are doing questions for your own revision, Make sure you cover at least one of each type of wave. So they will talk about string wave or rope. And then there is air column. Air column got open end and close end. Okay. Make sure you know how to uh, draw all the possible frequencies or wavelength and label note and anti note. This is the first skill that they can test. Second one, we can find lambda or frequency and then use V equal to F lambda. Third one, they can ask you about the phase differences. This one all have to analyze, have to practice, okay? Ask you face differences, and what else can they ask you? I think that's it already, more or less, bah, okay? Um, things that you need to remember is conditions, okay? Conditions for stationary wave. The comparison for stationary wave. Standing versus progressive. These two can memorize. You don't do also never mind. But do some la, don't like that. Okay, so that's sending wave. And we're going to move on to the next part, which is squarely in chapter uh, 15, superposition. So I have actually already done the first part of superposition with you, which is standing wave. So the first phenomena is this one. Standing wave. Yes, very popular. Confirm will come up one. Either you get a structural question or you get one or two objective. You decide lah, whether you want to burn the standing wave question. Okay, superposition, also very popular and important. There are generally three types. Okay, the first one is diffraction. The first one is diffraction. Grating. Not grating, uh, diffraction. One slip. This one got no equation. You just need to identify the pattern of diffraction. So I'm going to pull up some parts here. Normally, or most of the time, if not all of the time, this one will be objective one. So for objective question, when they ask diffraction, O N nineteen paper one one question twenty seven okay so I'm gonna okay so for diffraction you need to know the pattern which I'm gonna talk about soon and then also what is diffraction 
which is known as the spread, like spreading peanut butter and jelly, spreading of the wave, specifically wave energy, lah, but wave is good enough, as it passes a gap or obstacle. We are going to focus on gaps most of the time. So this pattern is not new. Like you see, you pass through this. You think about this. Huh? If let's say this amount of wave pass through this area, then by right only here got wave law. Why the wave spread out one? Diffraction. So everything here is the spreading. Spread. Yeah, spread. So the energy actually decreased one. Because now oh, this yellow bar is spread outwards. So there's less energy. Ma. It spread the energy. Okay. So um, the gap is slowly widened. Gap slowly widened. So let's say I call this gap A. A increase. Which changes, if any, which changes, if any, occurs to theta and the wavelength of the emerging wave. So for diffraction, wavelength will always remain the same. If you want to change the wavelength, the only way is to go through refraction, but not in syllabus. Refraction changes wavelength and only refraction. So it's wrong with you. So if let's say A increase, now I look at A. Uh, A is about the same size as lambda. So right now, this gap, the gap is more or less equal to lambda. If I increase the gap, it will be harder to diffract. There will be less spread. Less spreading. So maybe this one will spread until here and here only. So your theta will decrease, the answer is A. So the whole idea here is smaller gap, more spreading. The ideal condition in terms of magnitude, lambda should be around the size of the gap, 2 to 3, up to 10 times either direction, 10 times bigger or 10 times smaller around there. Okay, this one normally is objective. Nothing much to ask you. Right? Besides, also definition, uh, they can ask. All right. So next, after the fraction, why I label this one as one? This is two. Okay. Anyway, this thing is recorded. Okay, it's a recording. So here, after the fraction, we look at interference. And interference itself, we are going to compare this with the principle of superposition. Okay, so for interference, the first thing that you need to know is the type of interference. Conditions for constructive and number two, conditions for destructive interference. Okay, so constructive interference is when two waves meet and they become bigger. So let's start with principle of superposition. Superposition tells us that when two waves meet or overlap, the resultant wave is equal to the sum of each sum of displacement of each individual wave. Okay, so the resultant wave is equal to the sum of the displacement. I guess the displacement of the resultant wave is the sum of the displacement of the individual wave. So basically, I'm saying A plus A will give you weak 2A. Talking about this. So if you want constructive interference, we must talk about the angle. 
go back to picture. Where's my picture? There we go. Let's say these two waves is going to overlap. And I want it to be constructive, meaning I want it to be big, big wave. So if it's big, it should overlap like that. Directly on top, ah, so you build each other up. Yeah, I give up. Hang on. Nah, like that. Ta da! Directly on top. So the phase difference is zero, and the next phase difference will be 360. Okay? One an entire cycle away, that would be 360. And why can't I click the circle? Hello? Okay, nah. So zero. One complete cycle is 360 or zero again. So when we think about trigo, right, the phase angle will be zero degree, 360 degree, 720 degree, dot, 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 dot. Conditions for destructive interference is 180 degree, half a cycle. I prefer to think of pi, but I don't know why my student don't like pi radian. Why, uh? why you don't like pi? Okay, never mind. 180 times 3, 540. 180 times 5, 900. Dot, dot, dot. So basically, oh, is 180. It's pi, la, pi, pi. Okay, allow me. 3 pi, 5 pi, all the odd pi. This is the even pi. 2 pi, 4 pi. Very nice one. Okay, so if you know constructive and destructive interference, from here, we can ask the first type of question, which is using part difference to determine outcome, to determine interference outcome. When we talk about interference, it's about two things disturbing each other, interference. All right, so we're going to do a question now. Um, from your past year set, we have May, June. Okay, I'm not sure if I've discussed this before. Maybe I should do a different one. Felt like I may have discussed this. Okay, I'm going to do ON15 paper 2 2 so I can cover more question type. ON15 paper 2 2. Okay, so uh, we have talked about wave. Uh, sound wave. So now we are going to look at water wave. Okay, we have two dippers. First, we're going to, when they give you the graph of the wave, they ask you to find things like amplitude and wavelength. It's a very nice one. Very nice. Because this is bonus mark. Any marks? Let's start from the top. Here we have two dippers and you've got two point A and B. We want to demonstrate interference. All right. We connect this to a motor and DC power supply. Initially, only D1 vibrates on the water surface. The variation with distance X from D1 at one instant of time is shown here. So Let's say we take point B as a reference point. Uh. So this is X. And your X can be many, many distance oh, all the way. Okay, I don't know where point B is because I don't know how far away B is. But taking distances away from D1 is this X. Okay, and this Y would be the amplitude of the wave. So imagine if you put tiny polystyrene balls, the balls will bob up and down. It's the highest and the lowest position of the polystyrene. Okay. So now if you're asked to find the amplitude of the wave, you can just take this maximum thing here. This is 2.4, 2.8, 5, 3.2, 3.2 mm. And the wavelength here is just one complete cycle, 20 mm. You want you can put 20.0. Can we put can we read 20.0? 20 21, 22, 20, okay, maybe not 20. La. Two dippers are made to vibrate, and the waves are produced by both dippers on the water surface. State whether these waves are stationary or progressive. 
the wave is progressive because we don't have identical wave traveling in opposite direction. Okay, you have D1, the wave is traveling out this way. We, we. You have D2, the wave is traveling out this way. We, we. Sound effect to entertain myself. Okay, so they are traveling away from the deeper. So it's obviously progressive. State and explain. Oh, don't forget to don't state and never explain. Huh? So this is because the wave, the water wave profile uh, travels away from D1 and D2 as wave source towards I guess towards AB. Though. Explain why D1 and D2 are connected to the same motor. Why should we put D1 and D2 to the same motor? Why must, why cannot separate me? Why cannot separate me? Why? Yeah? Let's think. Hmm. Is there a reason? Interference is like a very, like we need the wave. Okay, let me go back to this picture. We need the wave to meet in such specific terms. And these two waves must always have the same wavelength. If not, all, then sometimes they will build and sometimes they won't build up. So, let's see. Okay, I'm going to close some of this. Uh, why do we connect this to the same motor? There's a C word here. Let's see. Let's check the chat. C for chat. Oh, no one replied in chat. Okay. So can I say that this is because the waves have to be coherent? What is coherence? What is coherence? Well, Coherence is when both waves have the same phase relationship. Okay? So there are two ways to answer this. You can say so that the waves from D1 and D2 are both coherent. Or you can even define coherent for them. They are both, uh, they both have the same phase relationship. So they can ask you what coherence is. Coherence is same phase relationship. They will move together. Okay. So it's not like suddenly you look at the wave. Suddenly you look at the wave, the wave is like this. And then you look at the wave again, then this wave go and change a bit. Then you look at the wave again, the wave change a bit. Very stressed like that. Suddenly, your teachers are friends. Suddenly, your teachers are enemy. That is a very stressful situation. We want a coherent, coherent relationship. Non-coherent relationships are often toxic. Joking, joking, joking. Okay, anyway. A and B are at these distances. Stay and explain. Hmm. Isn't this what the chat wants? Many stay and explain questions. Stay and explain. The variation with time. So variation means the changes with respect to time. Uh, the displacement of the water on point A and point B. Okay, to minimize uh, multiple scrolling and lecturer motion sickness. Students find uh, I, my brain actually quite pain one. Okay, here we are going to compare distances. Let's look at D1A. D1A is this length. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight this one. This is D1A. And D1A is 5 cm. D2A is 7 cm. And these two waves are going to meet at A. So one wave is traveling further than the other wave. D2 is traveling further than D1. So let's see if I can find 
a path difference diagram for you. OK, so in terms of what is going on now, if you look at this. So you look at this, uh, this is L1, which is your 5 cm and your L2, which is your 7 cm. We move, move, move. And how do we know what we'll get? Uh? So if I can, okay, let me make this bigger. If you look at this point here, you see that the extra distance traveled by the bottom wave is more by one and a half cycle. Hey, wait, wait, I remember, Miss, I remember. This is one, two, three, three pi, correct, law. So if this is three pi, it's destructive interference. Oh, what about one pi? Decrease, 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 decrease. Plop. Uh, one cycle here, constructive interference. Ooh. Okay, let's go higher, higher. Da, 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 da. So we have one pi, one and a half pi, destructive. The next one will be two pi. So not two pi, uh, two lambda or four pi. This is constructive. And then two and a half cycle destructive. So it's all about the difference extra distance between L1 and L2. If it's ngam ngam, one cycle, just nice one cycle or two cycle or three cycle, you will get constructive. If it's half cycle or one and a half cycle, now this is half cycle, you will get destructive. Okay, that one no label. So whenever it's half cycle, one and a half is destructive which is the conditions for interference. So we can actually compare them. First thing, we're going to talk about the path difference because we have to explain. So the path difference here is equal to 2.0 cm. But miss, how do I know whether this extra 2 cm, so let's say I dot 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 here and this 2 is the same length. This extra 2 cm, is it one lambda? Is it two lambda? How I know how many lambda? Ayo, we calculated the wavelength. What? Lambda is 20 mm. So I write here big, big for you. Lambda is 20 mm or 2.0 cm. So when the phase difference is 2 cm, phase difference is also equal to one lambda. So if the path difference is one lambda, the phase difference, phase difference is angle, okay? Path is length. Like you walk on the pathway, length. Length. Phase is angle. Okay? So the phase difference now will be one complete cycle, 360 degree. So hence, we will get constructive interference is this good enough miss no how does the displacement change with time for constructive interference so you could say that the displacement of the water is maximum or the water actually maximum varies I mean, it changes from maximum to minimum, back to maximum. You expect some form of like oscillation, what, right? Okay, so I guess you would say that the what oscillates the displacement of the water is, uh, oscillating at the amplitude of what's the amplitude? Huh? you have. The wave from D1, okay, plus the wave from D2. Their difference is 2 cm, which is lambda. So D2 travel extra 2 cm, okay. So D2 will travel extra 1 lambda and then meet with D1, like this. So this is your delta L, 2 cm, D2. Okay, so what is the amplitude here? We have information, so we must include them. This amplitude, if we look here, is 3.2 mm. So the resultant 
will be 3.2 times 2. So something like this. 3.2 times 2 because this amplitude here is 3.2. So with the amplitude of 6.4 cm mm mm. Okay, where is B1? B1 is when you mention the part difference or the part difference is lambda. Part is safer because they see all of this length. So you must comment on part difference. This is your B1. The other B1 is when you mention displacement of the water is oscillating at the amplitude of 6.4. We need oscillating or vibrating with the amplitude of 6.4 mm. This is B1. Okay, This can be quite hard because students may not even think of writing max, I mean, amplitude of 6.4 mm. Or they may write something like maximum displacement, which is not sufficient to describe the water wave. You say constructive interference, then you say maximum displacement. But, but what do I see? I see that the water is going to oscillate with a lot of energy. All right. So, um, I. Let me try to find that uh, video that I found or I show in that is shown inside your lecture. Okay, so here, what I have is a video from Veritasium, very good physics channel. But you see, he has two deeper. We assume he is a coherent motor, okay, so he can. Vibrate them with a constant phase relationship. Constant enough for us to see a pattern. So when he vibrates, the wave will travel out like a progressive wave. Now you have two vibrating. Let's see where they overlap. So we're obviously going to do a post, some post video editing to adjust the filter. But you can see that there are places. I, uh, there are places where we get constructive and destructive interference. So maybe your point A is somewhere here and your point B is somewhere here. This is A, this is B. So water particles along this line will have maximum amplitudes, 6.4 mm. But this water particle is actually moving up and down, okay? Because you can see the particle is moving up and down. If you look at this view, Side view, you can see the water particle is moving up and down. So here, the water particle will oscillate at maximum amplitude at constructive interference. All this part, this one where it looks like the water is not moving, the water is still, this is destructive interference. Okay, so if we go back to our explanation here, this is why we need to use the phrase displacement of the water is oscillating at the amplitude of this one or water is oscillating at the amplitude of 6.4 mm okay what about b talk so much already what is b yeah okay so we're going to repeat the same consideration for b but d1 b is 5 and 6 cm so i'm gonna highlight again b d1 b is 5 cm and d2 b is 6 cm so d2 is again slightly longer but 5 and 6 cm means the delta L part difference is equal to 1 cm, which is lambda over 2. So hence, the phase difference will be equal to half a cycle, 180 degrees. Oh, so destructive interference. So hence, destructive interference. Water is still and calm, does not move, also can. Calm before the storm. All right. So this one is interference. Lah. And if you bring it one step ahead, we know that we can get repeating patterns of interference of maxima and minima. Okay. So... If you remember 
this one, oops, this one that I show you, nah, 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 this one. What we tend to see a lot, right, is the double slit equation. Because what we have here is one slit, two slit, one deeper, two deeper, one hole, two hole, and then we meet at different, different interval. We get dark, bright, dark, bright, fringe. Okay, so this constructive and destructive interference is the second type of case that we are going to look at because we will apply this then to the double slit experiment. So this double slit, Uh, is for light. This is for light, but it doesn't have to be light. It just needs a double coherent source. So if your coherent source, you can use a double slit for light. You can also use two deeper plus same motor. You can also use two speaker connecting to the same signal generator. Two speaker plus same signal generator. All this is interference. And normally when they show you this, you still need to know part difference. But they are going to add on with the double slit interference equation. So how do we know it is interference? There is always two, two, two wave source. And we are going to use the equation of lambda is equal to AX over D. I draw a big rectangle and highlight for you. <laughs> know how to use the equation. So the setup normally is either you have two double slit or two speaker or two things here. I'm just going to call this S1 and S2. The distance between S1 and S2 is your A. We're going to take a point at the back here as a screen. Like how we took a point here. All the point along this line is your screen. Okay, so we're going to pull a screen here. And the distance between the double slit and the screen here to here is your D. So what do we expect? We expect bright dark, bright dark fringes. So in the middle point is bright. So here is dark. So you kind of expect kind of bright dark, bright dark formation happening. The, sep the distance between dark to dark is X. Bright to bright is also X. Okay, so this is what we call the fringe separation. So X is fringe separation. So when we use this equation, lambda is AX over D, the lambda is the wavelength that pass through these slits. So they will come from the same wave source one, lambda. So they should have the same wavelength. Know how to use the equation for this one and also know the delta L for this one. Like for example, in the middle here, ding, 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 when you get this bright fringe, delta L is zero. Here, delta L is 0 0.5 lambda, bright fringe lambda. For an example that discusses this, I highly recommend you watch the recording or even better, try the question from ON18, paper 21, question 4. I will roughly show you the setup here. Okay, so you can see this one. Tell you what, I will crop the setup. Lah. So if you want to use this uh, equation here, I'm going to move this to the side. Don't worry, I'll arrange it properly before I print out. So this is your double slit, and then you have lambda here. So this is central bright fringe because when the wave come from here to here, and this wave come from here to here, 
your delta L is zero. No change, ma. Okay. Then as we travel, the delta L will increase. The difference will be more and more. The dark fringe is 0 0.5 lambda. The bright fringe is 1 lambda. Dark fringe, 1.5 lambda. Bright fringe, 2 lambda. Do you see my geometric, my geometric, my arithmetic progression? You keep adding half a lambda. Ding, 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 ding. But if you want to look at, look at the phase angle, the phase difference, this is zero. This is half a cycle, 180. This is 360. This is 540. This is 720. Okay. Or we can think of pi, la. 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 0. Okay, so this is why we have bright dark, bright dark, bright dark in intervals. And then if you want to calculate anything, you have your lambda, you have your A, you have your D, and this 22 mm will be, you count know how many X is there. Bright to bright is X, dark to dark is also X. You calculate know, how many X are there between the top and the bottom. All right, so go and try this question from ON18 paper 2 1. Because we meet differently, we will get different pattern. And they can test you this question in many different ways. Lah. So try this question. And also, um, for harder questions, sometimes we will make sure that we change the intensity of the source. So uh, I won't discuss the question because I'm pretty sure that there is recording. And it's also included in this question. So recommend you try or review the question or pretend you never watched the recording of the discussion of this question. Go and try first, then only watch. You can find it in the superposition playlist. But it's one of the older videos. So uh, I was still recording using voiceover, thinking that it would save you time. But I noticed that students don't learn very well that way. But I've already recorded it, so you can watch it. And if you don't understand, get in touch. La, you know where to find me. Okay, let me see if chat got any question to comment okay so we need to know double slit and single slit then one slit two slit three slit le? many slit le? okay good news for you we don't need to know many slit we just need to we don't need to know three slit four slit five slit we just need to know for many many different slits i'm not sure if that is good news is it good news or bad news? You need to know for many different slits. So, many different slits. Wait, uh, let me move this back to original position. The third one and the final one in the superposition chapter would be your diffraction grating. Okay, so give me a few seconds to organize this. If not, it will be a bit of a be a bit of a pickle. Uh, let's move this here. Very good. Okay, so go try this question. And I need a bit more space to talk about the grating. Whenever I see the word grating, I think of cheese grater and then I'm hungry. Why do I always record videos so close to food time? Motivation to finish fast. Okay, diffraction grating. One slit, two slit, n slits. Okay, so we generalize to many, many slits. The difference between a diffraction grating and double slit is the pattern that you will observe. So let me go and just show you a quick picture. The more slits we have, the cleaner the pattern. And we like clean patterns because uh, it provides a nice view and we can measure the distance between bright fringes easily. Okay. So the first thing you can look at is this one. All right. So from here, if I increase the slit, uh, this is one slit, this is two slit. Two slit is actually quite unique because you can see the gap or... Okay, let me see if I can open this one in a bigger image. Wow, so big, so big. Okay, never mind. So this two slit, you can see the gaps are about the same. But as you increase the slit, right, the bright gaps become bright dots. 
Okay, so the, the image will become sharper, which is why when we pass through a grating, okay, we will go from something like this to something like this. Clean and nice like this. So we like this kind of clean pattern. Okay, I also kind of want you to uh, notice that if you look at this pattern, right, if we pass through a non-monochromatic light, meaning light with many wavelengths, you will get the rainbow color, but the green is at the same position-ish. It's obviously not as clean as this one because white light have many wavelengths, but you can see the, the relationship between these two. Okay, so um, ideally in the lab, uh, we will be able to reproduce this and actually to get you to measure your theta by passing through a grating. And a diffraction grating, um, I don't really remember if I have shown you how it looks like in real life, but a grating will look like this. Okay, so it's just a pane of glass with many, 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 many drawings. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I got proof this in the lecture video, but right now we don't have time to prove, so we just need to use the equation for now. So from here, we have the piece of grating. Piece of grating here is basically just a glass that I use machine to draw many, 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 many slits. And it will tell you something like 600 lines per mm, or let's say this is N lines per meter so the distance between lines or the gap size which is the distance between lines which is d is 1 over n but of course if they say so in eg uh, let's say 600 lines per millimeter so your d will be 1 mm we fit 600 lines. Miss, so close, I cannot see. Yes, we got machine to do this. Thank goodness, because if I ask you to do this, you will never finish your experiment. We will shine some light in. Okay, so some lambda in here. And then, uh, I'm, actually, I'm, my college got, la, our college got all the set up. You just no chance only. Maybe, hopefully, we get to have some physical classes and maybe I can find one day just to play with play this with you. Like. It's quite fun. It feels like disco. So in the middle, you will have a bright fringe. What I'm talking about is... Okay, I'm going to crop this, okay? Beautiful. Hello, shrink please. Shrink. Uh, so center here, you will get the zero order. Zero order. This is zero order. This one. N equal zero. Right in the middle. Okay. And then here, you will get another green line. And here, you'll get another green line. And here, you'll get another green line. And let's assume that's it. No more line already. Okay. So what we have is we will measure this angle theta. I want to tell you in the lab, there's no way you can see the light traveling. So there's no way you can measure the so-called theta. La. What will happen is you will probably... So I'm, what, what I want to measure is this angle here. This is my theta 1. This point will be n equal to 2. Sorry, n equal to 1. First order bright line. This one. First order. Second, zero order. So if you do maths, like differential equation, we say first order, second order. It's the same idea. La. We are counting. This is second order. This is third order. So all of these will have different angles. I'm going to use different, different color so we can differentiate them. If one note allows me to change color, good job, one note, like this. This is theta 2. And then like this, this is theta 3. 
So we will have dot 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 n equal to three and n equal to two. Aiyah, so we put everything together, lah, my friends. You d sine theta is n lambda. I got say I got record a quite long video explaining the constructive and destructive interference, but the idea is the same. This one is for bright lines only. Bright lines only. Constructive interference ma is always one lambda, two lambda, three lambda, four lambda. That's why you get n lambda here. Okay, find your theta. These questions, uh, both this equation will have graph. And CIE is uh, very peculiar about this. Um, we don't measure theta, but we can measure distances, right? We can measure the distance between the grating to the wall or the screen and the distance between the bright lines. And actually, these two equations are related one. But good news, or to make things simple for you, I'm guessing what, what CIE is thinking is for diffraction grating, we use this one. For double slit or double source or double anything, double, 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 we use this one. Can? All right. So uh, what are the questions that they will ask you besides calculation and using the equation? Um, there are some basic graphing. Actually, for both, they are graphing. La, but this one will get a bit more graph than the other one. Uh, they can ask you to find theta 1, theta 2. Sometimes they can. They are very sneaky one. They go and ask you to find this alpha. So sneaky, right? They ask you to find this alpha. Hiya, they need to find theta 3 minus theta 2. They can also ask you to find maximum number of lines. So example, this line got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Like this one is seven lines. How do we get seven? We take order, number of order times two plus one. Okay, so times two because of symmetry. On top got three, bottom also got three, symmetry. Plus one because of the bright fringe. Symmetry and plus one. But how do you find maximum order of bright lines? You'd use sine theta as your limiting factor. We let sine theta be equal to 1. Because the maximum value of sine theta is 1. Sine theta cannot exceed 1. So if you let sine theta be equal to 1, n lambda over d will be equal to 1. And then n will be equal to d over lambda. So whatever value is d over lambda is, you will get a number here. Okay? So use the lowest possible integer. Always round down. Even if you get a number like, for example, 4, no, wait, sorry, not 4, 3.8, it still means n is equal to 3. Because this is actually an inequality. If you're good with inequalities, what I'm actually doing is sine theta must be less than 1. So because of this, n lambda over d is less than 1. And because of this, n must be less than d over lambda. n must be less than 3.8. So n is equal to 3. This is what I'm doing. Either you are okay with inequality, but if inequality messes up with your brain or you're not good in maths, it is okay. Just equal to 1. Use the lowest possible integer because if the number is bigger than 3.8, oh, then you violate something that is very sacred. The right angle triangle. Your right angle triangle, uh, sine theta, can never exceed 1. If sine theta exceed 1 for right angle triangle, it's not a right angle triangle anymore, it's some other thing. Okay, How can your hypotenuse be shorter than your side or your opposite? All right. So should I do a question? Let me see the chat. Okay, I will choose one to do. And then we'll call it a day. Okay. Actually, I think if you if I see grading, it's quite nice because the question is quite easy one. All right, let's do a question regarding grading. I didn't do any MCQ, so if you're watching this and you're preparing for your exam, please go and spam some MCQ. Okay. Spam some MCQ question for yourself. 
All right. And I'm doing a superposition slightly ahead of time, waves and superposition, compared to the electricity and kinematics, because I, based on marking the trial paper, I noticed this is the chapter that people need the most help with for some reason. So that's okay. That's why we are here. All right. So this one is from Winter 19, paper 2 3. Light emitting from a slit of a diffraction grating are coherent and produce interference patterns. State explain why it's meant by coherence. This is when the uh, phase relationship between the waves are constant. It's a grating, okay? So there are many waves. Interference is when waves overlap the sum of the resultant wave sum of the resultant what am i writing sorry displacement of the resultant wave is equal to the sum of the displacement of the individual waves. Okay. A lot of times, um, my suggestion is if you struggle with writing definition, it's worth it to take up one day or a few hours of your time to go and dig out all the definition and write your own notes as a memory tool. There are, avail there are some available online, no problem, but knowing it is better. Okay. Constant, the same, the same meaning, right? Constant and the same, no change. Huh? I don't know whether in further maths they have a different meaning, but in my brain, constant means the same, means never change. Okay. Anyway, narrow beam of light from a laser is incident normally on a diffraction grating. If not normal, it's not incidibus. Spot of lights are seen when the screen is pr positioned parallel to the grating. Angle corresponding to the second order maxima is 51. So this is n equal to, this is n equal to. Number of lines per unit length is this one. Determine the wavelength of light. Well, this one is easy. I can do d sine theta is n lambda. I want fun lambda. Let me rearrange first. Lah. Lambda is d sine theta over n. What's my d? Oh, d is 1 over n, right? I guess I can find d first. Lah. 1 over n. So this is 1 over 6.7 times 10 to the power of 5. So... There's more space in the actual paper. Just wanted to save my students for toasted money. Before COVID. So I tend to squeeze questions together. All right. So what this is. Is 1.49 times 10 to the power of negative 6. Okay, I want to put that in. 1.49 times 10 to the power of negative 6. Sine 51 divided by 2. My friend, please, please don't make the mistake of having your calculator in radian and forgetting to convert. Make sure your calculator is in degree. So 1.49 e to the power of negative 6 times sine 51. Because sometimes uh, I look at the students' answer, I don't know how on earth it's possible to get that number. Then I change my calculator to radian and I go, oh, and I give zero. Calculator is always in degree for physics. Okay. Can I? All right. Nah. That's all. State and explain the change, if any, on the distance between the second order maximum when the light from the laser is replaced by light of shorter wavelength. Okay, d sine theta is n lambda, sine theta is n lambda over d. Let our wavelength 
drop, wavelength drop, lambda decrease. So this sign theta will decrease, theta will decrease. So I will say the angle decreases or smaller angle for the second order maximum. Hence, if the angle is smaller, so first it was 51 degree, and now the angle is smaller, what happens to the distance? Shorter distance, law? hence distance between the maximum spot is shorter. Mm. One mark only. So angle decreases, distance is shorter, B1. Okay. For the question, uh, I didn't do very hard ones because I feel that this is generally for people who need some basic speed run. But if you need some recommendations of slightly more challenging question to do regarding this, I would suggest to try... Of course, the harder one is objective, lah. All right, but just go spam some objective. But you can try this. When 18, paper 2, 2, question 5 for interference. Okay, I think I will list down things that you can try. Diffraction grating, interference and superposition, and standing wave. So let's choose three of each that looks a bit different than what we discussed today. Question four. Mm. Okay, this one you can do May, June 18, paper 2, 3, question 5. Just do all the 18 papers. Lah. There are so many wave questions in May, June series. This is nice. There's no picture. GG. Try this one. See whether you understand the question or not. Because it never draw any picture for you. And just now, I also mentioned for interference, you can try ON18, paper 2, 1, question 4. Please try this one. So it's quite hard. Quite. Just a little, just a little, little bit, not too much. You can do it. Not too much. Okay, let me find that complicated deflection. You can... Okay, I'm going to include a graph for the deflection grating as well. So this is the diffraction grating graph. If you tried the model paper that I've provided in class, uh, you will see that I have also included a question that looks a lot like this one that involves the graph one. Okay. Actually, the difficult one is an older question. Now, but let, me, let me try to see if I can find it. So this one you should try something older. By the way, if you're watching to here, let me give you something I noticed. Lah. I noticed CIE recently have a tendency to repeat questions, but they like to repeat paper two and paper four question, the structure questions, from, from a place like about five, six, four, five, six years ago. They won't repeat the question identical because this is not objective, but what they will do is they will change the question a bit, but they are testing the same thing. Because uh, boring already, uh, so they ask new things. Well, okay, la, good enough. Leo. It's good enough. Mm. Okay, um, if you want to try more interference questions, you can... But they are all they all look about the same to me, lah. So go try the other stuff. 
Right, so these are suggestions, suggested question that you can try. It's not inclusive of everything that you need to know, but I think and I believe it is good enough. What's another one in 2019? That was a bit interesting. Ah, if you want an interference graph, it would be this one. FM19 paper 22 question 5. Oh, and this is a hard one. May, June 19, paper 2, 1, question 5. Okay, la, enough. If you can do <laughs> so many. 4, 4, 11. You're okay already. Do and understand, uh, not do and look at Mark Skin. Okay, so go try out these questions during this weekend if you need it. Um, and you should also go and look at the recent questions. La. So you look some, basically you look some at the recent ones, you do a few, and then you look at the four or five years ago, and then you do a few. All right? And level up your understanding. Okay, that's it for waves and superposition. You know how to describe waves, amplitude, frequency, classify them, Transverse, longitudinal, progressive, standing. Standing is a bit special. You need to know the condition. You need to compare it. You need to define all the ways we describe wave, amplitude, frequency, wavelength, period, intensity. Phase angle is something that you should try. Go and find a few objective questions to try. Okay, And also read, reading the CRO, which I didn't include here. I assume people know how to read the CRO. Make sure you know how to read the CRO reading. Okay. And then I move on to chapter 15, where we talk about not just a stationary wave, because for standing wave, they can, in the situation of string or air column, ask you the most important skill is to draw the standing wave and label node and anti node. Based on node and anti node, you can find wavelength or frequency because node to node is lambda over 2, anti node to anti node is also lambda over 2. They use V go F lambda low. There are some phase differences. Answer is always 0 degree or 180 degree. Things that you need to memorize are the condition and the comparison. Okay. Other uh, phenomena that we study in superposition is diffraction. This one just need to know the pattern. And then superposition, either just looking at part difference or leveling up to double slit, where we look at part difference at different, different position and using this equation. Diffraction grating is d sine theta is n lambda using the equation and sometimes finding the maximum number of lines. Here are the suggested questions to try, discuss with a friend, watch tutorials if they are, or reach out if you need help. All right, that's it. Chapter 14, 15. How many marks to expect? I think we are looking at P1, maybe about... Seven to seven to eight questions, six to eight questions, lah. Okay, and for P two, we are definitely looking at at least one question. But I'm thinking about marks, so about eight to twelve marks. So about twenty percent of your paper. Twenty percent of your AS syllabus. Okay, that is all. Lee. The particle physics and the young modulus one that we did prior to this, both in combination is also about 15%. This one. About 10 to 15%. Okay, so you can go and watch that. Chapter 1 and 2 at most is 10% because we are asking a lot of 1 and 2 in paper 3. All right, that is it.